what I've been asked to do is talk to you all about paraproteinemias. And uh, some of you, most of you are really familiar with this term, because this, this is a term that, that you've heard and read in books and, and you know, heard about. Um, what you may not realize is that the, the conditions that are associated with paraproteinemias is huge. There's a big list of conditions that includes plasma cell and lymphoproliferative disorders and certain infections. So it's a very, very big list of, of conditions that are associated with paraproteinemias. You're not necessarily going to get into all of that, but we're going to touch on some of the main conditions. And again, when you're dealing with a big topic like this, what I like to do is to really give you conceptual understanding of what this is and give you some highlights of some of the most common things that we deal with in the clinical setting for patients that have, uh, have the condition. So that's what I'm going to do with paraproteinemias. We're going to start by looking at what it is, what it looks like, what it can do to patients, and then we'll kind of touch on some of the most common conditions that are associated with uh, paraproteinemias. All right, so, so when you think of paraproteinemias, what exactly is, what exactly is it? What's a paraprotein? So, so in, in the simplest of terms, a paraprotein simply is an abnormal protein that's not supposed to be there, that's not supposed to be in a lab test. And, and the, 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 the term comes from the detection of an abnormal band on protein <coughs> electrophoresis. We'll look at that in just a minute. So if you run an electrophoretic gel of you know, serum proteins on, on, uh, um, uh, you know, on a regular electrophoretic gel, you expect to see normal bands. Okay? And if you see something that is not normal, that is a paraprotein. Okay. That's basically where the term comes from. So it's just an abnormal protein detected on protein electrophoresis. Typically, this protein is an immunoglobulin, and that could either be an intact immunoglobulin or it could be a piece of an immunoglobulin, what we call as light chains. And the source of this is usually either plasma cells, which is the most common, well-known cell that, that makes immunoglobulins, or it can also be lymphocytes. There are lymphoproliferative disorders that can do that as well. So most of you all have seen a plasma cell. Uh, this on the left side is the picture of a plasma cell uh, as you see it under the microscope under the, with h and &E stain. Here's the nucleus which is eccentric. You have a dark blue cytoplasm and then you have this halo uh, right around the nucleus which is really the, the active uh, production of, of immunoglobulins that this, this cell does. This is really the, one of the main functions of this cell, is to, is to make uh, immunoglobulins. So we talked about this being an abnormal protein on, on electrophoresis. So just, let's just look at that. Okay. How does that really look? So here's how normal electrophoresis looks. So just uh, follow this with me here. Down here is a gel okay, where you basically had uh, a sample put in of a patient's serum, and they've run it on a, on a gel, and all the different bands have separated out. And over here, you see the corresponding um, waves that you can you can uh, get from this uh, uh, from this breakdown of the of the different bands of the protein. So, basically, this over here is albumin. This is alpha one, alpha two, beta, and gamma. Okay. These are the different regions. This is normal. I'm just showing you the normal situation. Okay. And here's the corresponding waves that you see if you, if you kind of do this, spec, if you transfer this information um, uh, spectroscopically, you're going to get these waves corresponding to these individual uh, bands on the, uh, on, the, on the electrophoretic gel. And so here we see albumin, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, and gamma. Now these numbers, this, this alpha, beta, gamma, this does not refer to immunoglobulin types. It doesn't refer to IgA, IgM, or Ig, or any of those things. All this is referring to, this, this, this beta, gamma, all these numbers, all this is referring to is the mobility of that group of proteins. So this is a gamma region, and many proteins are there in the gamma region. Now it so happens that most immunoglobulins run with this electrophoretic mobility, and they fall in this region. But that is just what that means. It's just the gamma region. This is a bunch of proteins that have that property of running in that electrophoretic area, which is the gamma area, okay? So most immunoglobulins are right here uh, in, the, in the gamma region, and you see this like a nice smooth hump. Here's albumin, which is a, a you know, very prominent protein in the serum. You see a dark band here, 
you see a big spike. And here is this hump, because immunoglobulins are many different kinds. Albumin all looks the same. It's, it's the same kind of molecule. So you see a dark band and a big spike, whereas the other protein, the other immunoglobulins and other proteins in this gamma region are heterogeneous. And so you see a diffuse band, and you see a hump, a nice smooth little hump. Okay. Now if something happened that causes these, these proteins to, to increase a lot, like infection, and if it's polyclonal, you're still going to see a very, very heterogeneous population of antibodies. So what will happen is that this band will get darker, but it will still remain very diffuse. And this hump may get taller, but it's still going to remain smooth, and it's just going to look like a hump. Okay. However, if you get a monoclonal protein because of a mutation in the cells that make it, then this band is not going to look this, this diffuse, and you're going to see a change. In, in, the, in, the, in the wave as well, and this is what you're going to see. So you see here, in the gamma region now, in this patient who has now a monoclonal immunoglobulin, where you see a, a very dark band almost corresponding to the same kind of thing that you see with albumin, you see that band here, it's not diffuse anymore, it's very discrete, and here, instead of a hump, you see a spike. Okay? That's an indication that there's a very homogeneous population of antibody, immunoglobulin molecules, that is, that, is compo that is filling up the space here, and that's why you see this. This is basically a paraprotein. Okay. This is what you see in immuno and, and, uh, serum protein electrophoresis. Now, as I said, this doesn't tell you anything about whether this is IgG, IgA, or anything like that. Okay. All this tells you is that there's a monoclonal protein. You can do an additional test, and I'm pointing this out to you because this, this is terminologies that you will see uh, in your lab reports, you might see it on your, on your boards, on your tests. So it's important to understand that. In order to identify what this protein really is, you have to do another gel, and that's called an immunofixation electrophoresis, where now you're using probes to actually look for the immunoglobulin molecules. Okay? And here's the example of that. So here on the top is the same thing I showed you. A patient with, you know, this is albumin, and here's a spike in the gamma region showing a monochrome antibody. And then they take this patient's sample and they run uh, the gel, and they run it in multiple wells here. Okay, so these are all individual wells, and each well is probed by a different probe. This is looking at IgG, IgA, IgM. This is kappa. This is lambda. Okay, in this patient, you see that all the wells are negative over here. The immunoglobulins, but the IgG is strongly positive, and the lambda is strongly positive. So this is a monoclonal antibody that is IgG lambda. Okay. That's how you identify the antibody. And this is the immunofixation part of that. Okay. So this is, this is typically how we detect these, these paraproteins in the lab. One thing I want to point out here is that even though the majority of these paraproteins are indeed intact immunoglobulin molecules, some, sometimes, approximately 20% or so of the time, they can be pieces of the, of the immunoglobulin. Typically, what we would call as light chains, okay? And light chains are simply this part. So this is, this is the whole molecule here. And light chains are just the, the small little piece over here, where the heavy chain is down here, um, which can break off because of the, the, you know, the, the fact that the, the clone of cells that's making it is defective to begin with. And, and they proliferate and they start making cell, uh, these immunoglobulins that fall apart and you have a lot of light chains that are, that are being made. These light chains can actually be detected by immunological techniques because the, 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 the advantage they, they take, so you know, how would you detect a light chain? You know, how would you distinguish it from another antibody? And the way they do it is they, they actually make probes that target the, the part of the light chain that is normally hidden in an intact immunoglobulin. Okay, so if it was an intact antibody, you would never, this, this surface would never be open. But because it's a light chain and it's separated from that, this is now open, and if a probe detects this, that's a light chain, because you would not detect it in an intact uh, molecule. Okay. So these light chains are tested for the labs. Uh, our lab included has, has assays to test for it, and they're reported as free light chains, either kappa or lambda, and there are normal ranges for that. Now these light chains can also go up in polyclonal infections or, or any other cause of polyclonal expansion of these, these antibodies. But, but there is an important uh, uh, ratio, which is the kappa-lambda ratio, which can be looked at 
to determine whether this increase is, is more likely to be due to a monoclonal process. So if you see that both of these things are elevated, then you look at the kappa lambda ratio. If it falls in the normal range, it is most likely a polyclonal <coughs> expansion. However, if the kappa lambda ratio is abnormal, meaning either too low, in which case it's the lambda that is elevated, or too high, in which case it's the kappa that's elevated, that's usually an indication that there's a selective expansion of one of these two um, light chains. And so that, that's usually an indication of a monoclonal protein. So, so uh, these are some of the assays that we, we use to look, at, uh, uh, to look at these paraproteins. Okay, so that's, I said all that to, do, to say this. Uh, we, have, we have looked at uh, an abnormal protein that is defined as abnormal because we see it that way on, on our electrophoretic studies. But why are we interested in these proteins? What, what, is, what is the clinical relevance of these proteins? Well, let me just uh, say that, that uh, obviously since we're taking this hour to talk about this, you, know, you can imagine that this has profound clinical consequences for patients. But I want to, to, to preface the next slide that I'm going to show you by, by saying that, that what these antibodies do to patients clinically depends on several factors. One of them is how much of these antibodies there are. Okay, So it's a quantitative effect. And number two, which is also very important and has nothing to do with quantity, is what kind of antibodies they are. Because some of these antibodies, even if they are not present in large quantities, their qualitative abnormalities can cause serious clinical consequences that we'll see in just a minute uh, with patients. So what's, what's the, the, the range? The range of problems that you can see with these patients is either basically no symptoms, no problems, what you might have been familiar with as MGUS, monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance, okay, where patients have a limited clone of abnormal plasma cells that are making these antibodies, and but they're not causing any, any significant problems to the patient. Or you can have the other end of the spectrum where you can have the same kind of clone, but, but very aggressive, making lots of abnormal proteins and causing a malignant phenotype, such as multiple myeloma or Waldenstorm macroglobulinemia, being examples of malignant diseases uh, associated with paraproteinemia. And then, as I said, there is also a subset of patients, fortunately a lot less common, where you actually can have a small amount of abnormal proteins, very limited proteins, sometimes very small, difficult to detect even, but they can cause catastrophic clinical outcomes for patients, okay, such as amyloid, amyloidosis and so forth. Okay, so, so this, is, this is really a, a fairly wide spectrum of, of clinical effects that you see with paraproteinemias, uh, ranging from no symptoms to potentially life-threatening and fatal uh, symptoms. And it, again, it depends on the quantity and, in many cases, the quality of the antibody that is being, being made. Just want to make a point about uh, artifactual effects on lab tests. Uh, I don't know if they're, they're going to ask you this on the board or not. My guess is it's probably more, more likely to be asked on hematology board, but you never know. Uh, any test that has water-based uh, reagents that are used in it. If somebody has a significant paraprotein, those tests can be affected. Here are some of the things that have been well reported um, that, that can be affected by people that have a significant paraprotein in their blood. Their cholesterol, HDL and LDL cholesterols can be falsely artifactually lowered by, by presence of these paraproteins. Bilirubin can be artifactually elevated and phosphate can also be artificially low. So it's important to keep in mind in, in, uh, in people that especially if you know that they have these problems. But uh, if you don't know that somebody has a paraproteinemia and things are not fitting well clinically, you know, it's, it's, it's important to look for it just to see if that might be the cause why you're seeing these abnormal labs. So, so obviously a, a wide range of, of clinical uh, effects um, of these paraproteins. I said earlier there's a lot of different conditions that can produce these paraproteins and we don't we are not going to get into the details of every condition, but here's a, a breakdown of uh, some of the most common uh, conditions that we, we see this associated with. And this is a series, more than a thousand patients from the Mayo Clinic uh, that they collected a few years ago. And as you can see, MGUS and multiple myeloma is 
a substantial majority of, of these patients that have paraproteinemias. Okay. And then you have some, some patients that have amyloidosis and then a whole variety of other less common conditions, uh, which we'll touch on a couple of those um, later on. But what I want to start with and what I want to focus more on is some of these more common conditions uh, that are associated with the paraprotein, uh, namely MGUS and, and multiple myeloma. So let's look at some of these, these basic definitions of some of these conditions and um, what we see clinically with it. So what you see here really from the left to the right is a spectrum, really it's a spectrum of possibly the same disease, but um, on the left hand side you have a more benign version of it and on the right hand side you have the full blown malignant multiple myeloma. So MGUS is clinically usually defined. Let me just uh, tell you a couple of uh, basic things about some, some numbers here. In general, plasma cells, the normal number of plasma cells in the bone marrow is about 5% or less. If it's 10% or more, that's considered myeloma. Okay. So if somebody has less than 10% plasma cells in their bone marrow, on the bone marrow biopsy, and they have a, a, a monoclonal spike, but it's less than 3 grams per deciliter, and they have no clinical problems, they have no consequences from these, these, these abnormalities. No bone lesions, no anemia, they don't have hypercalcemia, they, these, these antibodies are not damaging their kidneys, they have no end organ damage. That patient then, if they meet all those criteria, is then classified as MGUS. Okay. Now if somebody meets all of these criteria, however, they have more than 10% plasma cells, or they have more than 3 grams of protein, but they don't have any clinical effects. That patient is still that patient is now labeled as myeloma. However, it's called smoldering myeloma. So it's a kind of disease which typically right now clinically is still something that can be watched and doesn't require treatment. Multiple myeloma is defined by the presence of end organ damage. So if you have an M spike and you have elevated plasma, plasma cells and you have one or more of these problems, end organ problems, which you can attribute to these, to this then you have a diagnosis of multiple myeloma. Okay. So that's, that's in, in, in simple terms, the spectrum of plasma cell disorders that we see, the most common spectrum that we see uh, with paraproteinemias. So let me just tell you a little bit about MGUS. So MGUS, it's considered a benign condition, but as you know, you know this is, these are monoclonal cells, these plasma cells, even though they're, they're low in number and they're making a small amount of uh, M protein. But they are monoclonal cells, and they can progress to a malignant phenotype. And the rate of progression on an average from MGUS to multiple myeloma is usually about 1% per year in most patients. That's the average. But there are some people that are at lower risk and some people that are at higher risk. Okay. And people have tried to work out some of the risk factors that might, that might predict that. And these are the three risk factors that have been found to be quite significant. One is the free light chain ratio, if that is abnormal. People that have MGUS that is non-IgG, so if it's IgA or IgM or something like that, or if they have an M protein that is higher than 1.5 grams per deciliter. Okay. If somebody has all three of these factors, see this, this gray line up here, they, they have a much higher rate of progression to multiple myeloma you see, this you can see, you know, this is this is years here on, on this axis, and this is percentage that is progressing. Um, that this is well beyond one percent per year. This is a much more much higher risk. Whereas people that have none of these three risks, and the green bar over here, actually have a very low risk. It's actually well below one percent per year. And then you have people in between, which is the average. Okay, so we can use some criteria to kind of give us an idea of what these people, patients' risks are, but Overall, this is considered, MGUS is considered a, a, a disease that does not require treatment. Now somebody might wonder, you know, this is a potentially malignant disease, why would we not try to treat it and get rid of it? Well, the reason is simple, we don't, we cannot get rid of it, okay? This is one of those diseases, including myeloma, with, for which there is no curative therapy. All we do, all we can do for these diseases, and that's true for many conditions in oncology, is that we can control it, but we cannot completely eliminate it. So we only try to treat it if it starts causing problems. Since MGUS is by definition an asymptomatic condition, 
we don't try to treat it because anything we do, we cannot eliminate those clones. They're going to be back later on. Okay? So we don't treat these patients. They're usually followed. Initially, we'll follow them about every four to six months to make sure that they're not one of these people over here that are potentially going to progress very rapidly. But once they, if they fall into, into a low risk group, um, or if they don't show any signs of progression over a long period of time, we can usually follow them once a year. And some of these really low group, low risk group people over here, we can follow even less frequently. So all we do for these patients is just simply observation. We check them every few months, once a year, or once every other year, depending on their risk. And as long as they don't have evidence of malum, as long as they don't have symptoms, that's all they need. They don't need anything else. But as I said, some of these patients are going to get worse and they're going to develop a more problematic clinical profile. And the, the way that happens usually is by acquisition of additional um, genetic mutations. And here are some examples of that. Deletion of chromosome 13 usually is a, is a bad uh, prognostic indicator uh, in patients with plasma cell dyscrasias. And so these patients keep accumulating these various mutations and, and now these plasma cells which are just sitting there making this protein start doing a lot more. They start making more protein and they start doing things locally, bad things. They start making cytokines. They start chewing up the bone in the area. And when that happens, patients become symptomatic and now you have a malignant disease, which is multiple myeloma. Okay. So uh, let me um, take a, a few minutes here to just tell you a little bit about multiple myeloma and what, we, what it is and what we do uh, in terms of um, treating it. So multiple myeloma, once somebody progresses to it, if you look at all patients with multiple myeloma, and currently in the Western Hemisphere, it's about 10% of all uh, malignant uh, uh, hematologic uh, neoplasms. And it's actually number two uh, in terms of the, the most common hematologic malignancies in the Western countries. The number one is CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And these are some of the averages uh, in terms of the cases, new cases and deaths seen in the U.S. And as I said earlier, we don't have curative treatment for this. We only can control the disease when it's causing end organ damage. Okay. Well, who are the people that get it? Uh, we, don't, we don't know a lot about this, but all we, what we do know is that there is an ethnic predisposition. There's a much, clearly a much more significant risk or or prevalence of this in African Americans as compared to other races. Um, there is a slight male preponderance, not a, not a lot, but a slight male preponderance, and it tends to be a disease of older patients. The average age is about 65. Okay. What causes it? We have no idea. No idea at all. Okay. There are lots of studies that have looked at a variety of potential exposures and risks and so forth. Everything is, is is inconclusive on that. Okay, so we have no idea why people get multiple myeloma, right? Okay, so understanding what we know about multiple myeloma, it's not hard to understand why, if when these patients present clinically, that they have these kind of symptoms. You know, they can have weakness and fatigue because of anemia. They can have bone pains because their bones are being chewed up by those by those plasma cells that are in there. They can they can break. Uh, they make antibodies that they're not supposed to make, and on the other hand, they don't make antibodies that they're supposed to make. So these patients, in, even though they're making tons and tons of immunoglobulins, they're dysfunctional immunoglobulins, and their normal immunoglobulins are actually suppressed. So these patients can be at risk for infection as well. And then certainly these, these bad antibodies that they're making can then cause other end organ damage, including renal failure, which is a fairly common problem with these patients. So when you see a patient that looks suspicious for, for myeloma, obviously most of you all by now have an idea of what kind of test you're going to get. One of the things you're going to start looking at is look at their bones. And um, you know, you, in a classical case, you will see lytic lesions. So these are basically not blastic lesions like what you see in prostate cancer and so forth. These are basically areas where the bone has been chewed out. Okay. And you get an SPAP, you're going to see a, a monoclonal protein, and here's the typical breakdown. You know, most of them, most commonly, you will see IgG, but in then some cases you will see some of the other uh, immunoglobulins as well. And then, you, when you see this, you're going to do a bone marrow biopsy uh, to see how many plasma cells you have, and typically in patients with full-blown multiple myeloma, like that picture that I just showed you, uh, 
it's not going to be more than just 10 percent, you know, 15 percent or so. Most of those times, you'll see 60, 70, 80 percent plasma cells in those in those patients. Their bone marrow is full of it. Okay, you just look at it under the under the microscope, and all you see is tons and tons of plasma cells everywhere. Okay, and this is what uh, this is just an example of that. Okay, so once you have that, you've established a diagnosis, and this is what it takes. Just in summary, to make a diagnosis of multiple myeloma, you have to have a monoclonal protein with elevated bone marrow cells plus one, at least one of these abnormalities to indicate end organ damage, either hypercalcemia, renal damage, anemia, or bony lytic bony lesions, the so-called CRAB acronym, acronym right here. So C for calcium, renal, anemia, bone. Okay. So you need to have end organ damage. If you don't have this, but you have this, that's smoldering myeloma. Okay. And that patient does not need treatment because we cannot cure them. And if, it's, if the disease is not bothering them, we can usually follow them until they start developing any of these things, and then we can treat it, not because we're going to cure it, but because we're going to prevent these things from getting worse by treating it. Okay. So that's, that's uh, uh, what we, we do to, to make a diagnosis. So once you make a diagnosis, like with any cancer, you know, you're going to, to try to get some assessment on prognosis, and one of the things that, that is used to do that is to, is to get a staging of these patients. I only show this slide for historical interest. This used to be one of the staging uh, uh, systems for multiple myeloma. As you can see, it's, it's very, very um, uh, you know, wordy and involves a lot of different criteria. Even people that treated multiple myeloma on a regular basis, multiple myeloma experts, had to carry cards in their pocket to, to be able to, to use this thing for, for staging. Fortunately, it's really not used anymore. The current staging is done by the international uh, staging system which just uses two things, beta-2 microglobulin and albumin. That's it. So uh, as everybody here knows, higher albumin is good, and, but high beta-2 microglobulin is bad. So if somebody has a low beta-2 microglobulin, which is good, and high albumin, which is, which is also good, then they have a stage one disease. And if somebody has a high beta-2 beta microglobulin, regardless of the albumin, that's bad, and they have, uh, they have worse outcomes at stage three. And then everybody that's in between here is stage two, okay? And this, this uh, has actually been validated uh, in, in clinical studies where this staging actually bears out the patient's survival. Here's on the top of stage one, the survival, stage two and stage three. As you can see, the stage three patients have a, a much worse um, survival, uh, even with, with treatment. So with this information, we can now kind of start preparing our, our treatment plan for these patients. Now, before we do that, one of the things we also look at, as you can imagine, you know, this, this uh, survival curve over here is showing people, you know, the, the average, the median here is about, you know, two years or something like that. But there are some patients with myeloma who actually survive less than a year. This staging system cannot capture those patients. It's not able to do it. And that's why we do cytogenetics, because that's one of the things that can identify some of the real high-risk patients for us. So, for example, people that have deletion of 17P, which is P53, or deletions of chromosome 13, and some of these other chromosomes, they really have a bad prognosis. Chromosome 17 patients in particular do, do really badly. And, and that helps us to identify, again, patients that, that are probably going to progress rapidly and need more aggressive uh, intervention. Okay. So once all that is determined, we then make a plan for treatment. And as I said, the treatment for myeloma is, is primarily designed to control the disease so that it doesn't kill the patient by damaging their organs. And if you can control that, you will actually help improve people's survival because you keep the disease from damaging their, their organs. Even if you haven't cured it, it'll help prolong people's survival. It'll actually improve their quality of life as well. Okay. Here's just a snapshot. This is the only slide I'm going to show you. I don't think you all need to get into any more details about treatment for multiple myeloma. But this is just a snapshot of the past, present, and and possibly the future of the treatment of multiple myeloma. Um, in the mid, uh, middle of the previous century, there was nothing for treating these patients. It was just supportive care. They just, you know, they had pain, they gave them medicines, you know, they might have given them some herbs or something like that. That's all they did. And with supportive care, the median survival of these patients was about one year. Okay. And then in, in the 50s and 60s, uh, alkylating therapy, specifically melphalan, became available, and they combined that with prednisone, 
because people were realizing that that uh, steroids are active in lymphoid malignancies. Okay, so this regimen of melphalan and prednisone became very popular for multiple myeloma. They are both oral agents. They are both pills, and and in fact. This took the survival of patients, the median survival of patients with multiple myeloma from one year with supportive care alone to about three years. So about a three-fold increase in, in, in survival, median survival of patients with multiple myeloma. And as more time went on uh, in the 70s and so forth, there are more aggressive regimens such as VAD. Some of you might be familiar with this. VAD is vincristine, adriamycin, and decadron, which uh, combines a couple of chemotherapy drugs also with another potent steroid and what they showed is that this, these patients actually had a higher response and actually a much more rapid response as compared to melphalan and prednisone. And when they saw this, they started developing more aggressive regimens along these lines for multiple myeloma. And there were many reports that showed very high rates of response, very high, um, you know, very rapid responses and possibly better survivals. So, People started comparing this with melphalan prednisone to see, well, are we really making a difference in survival by these more aggressive regimens? And to make a long story short, there was a meta-analysis reported almost 12 years ago that looked at multiple trials comparing very aggressive regimens like VAD with melphalan prednisone. All of them showed better responses and better, um, uh, you know, quicker, faster responses but there was no difference in survival in that meta-analysis. So even though they, they, they responded better, their survival was no better than the just doing the melphalan prednisone alone. Then in the 70s and 80s, we started using autologous bone marrow transplant, where you know it's not a donor, it's the patient's own bone marrow is taken back and given, given back to them. And this has been felt to possibly prolong survival a little bit. There's some controversy about it, but overall, it's felt to be a good option for patients with myeloma. It doesn't cure them, but it, it prolongs survival compared to conventional therapy, which is basically all this stuff here. Now this is starting to come into some question because there are better therapies, conventional therapies that are becoming available now, such as the image, the, the biomodulating image, thalidomide, lenalidomide, they're both in the same category, just different side effect profiles. And this very interesting drug called bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor. It blocks proteasomes. Again, I, I don't think, uh, if somebody has a question, we'll, I'll be glad to talk about it, but I'm not gonna get into the details of the exact uh, uh, mechanism of, of proteasome inhibition. But, but these drugs have showed remarkable activity in multiple myeloma. And they've been combined with each other and with some of the older drugs and have actually showed, now have showed an improvement in survival over melphalan and prednisone. Clearly, improvement in survival over melphalan and prednisone. So, so the, the field has advanced with, with some of the newer drugs. And I want to, I'm taking a little time to tell you about all this because all the conditions that we, we, we uh, are going to look at after this, they're all treated in a very similar way. Okay? These agents that are used for treating myeloma are used for treating most of these conditions that I'm going to tell you about. Okay? So, that's, so we've talked about MGUS and multiple myeloma, what we saw as the most common, uh, most commonly seen conditions associated with paraproteinemias. Okay, now let's look at some of the some of the less common things, but but nonetheless very important as well because they can be quite quite uh, severe. Before I go to the, um, remember I told you earlier on this the spectrum is asymptomatic with small clone, then malignant, and then small clone but clinically severe. Before I go to the small clone, which you know you would expect would not cause any problem, but it does. Before we go to that, I want to touch on one other malignant disorder. Since we are talking about malignant um, conditions associated with paraproteinemia, and that is Waldenstorm macroglobulinemia. Okay, Waldenstorm macroglobulinemia is, in fact, in, in the WHO classification, it is classified as a lymphoma. It's classified under lymphomas, although it is it is really uh, a condition associated with significant uh, paraproteinemia and the paraproteinemia here is IgM which is a very large immunoglobulin and so it is associated with hyperviscosity risks for patients. Um, the cells that make this are actually not plasma cells neither are the lymphoid cells. They, they are typically called lymphoplasma cytoid cells okay? and they have a very typical appearance, they have a very specific immunophenotype and the pathologist should not have any problem identifying this. Um, if somebody has this, they will typically, clinically, 
be seen with things that you normally see with, with uh, paraproteinemia, like anemia and fatigue and so on. But then, as I said, because of the IgM, these patients are prone to hyperviscosity, where their blood becomes too thick, and they can then have risk for strokes, MIs, you know, cardiovas other cardiovascular problems, and so forth. Um, but also, these patients are associated with lymphadenopathy and organomegaly as well. So that's probably why they've been put under um, lymphomas in the, uh, in the WHO classification. Their treatment is actually quite similar to myeloma, except there are some agents that are used, such as, such as rituximab and nucleoside analogs, which, which, which are agents that we actually use in, in lymphomas. And again, that kind of speaks to their, their uh, you know, hybrid profile of where they're a little bit like plasma cells, but a little bit like lymphoid cells. So that's, that's Wardenstam mac macroglobal anemia. Not a common disorder, but it can be very dramatic when it presents. And, and uh, if you see a patient like this, uh, they need, many, many times they may need plasmapheresis for hyperviscosity. Um, anytime you see somebody with hyperviscosity, you have to really be cautious about giving them any blood or other blood products because if, you, if somebody with, say for example, somebody with Wardenstorms come in, comes in with a hemoglobin of six, um, the knee-jerk reaction would be to try to give them some blood. But the, but the right answer is you don't give them blood first. You get them, to, if, if, especially if they have a hyperviscous situation, if you give them blood, it could precipitate an MI or a stroke right there because that could put, put them over the edge as far as the hyperviscosity is concerned and cause an event. So you have to be very, very careful when you're thinking about any kind of transfusion for patients with, uh, with Wilder-Storm microglobal anemia. Okay. Now, with that, let me finish off by, by showing you a couple of conditions that, that are associated with a relatively small clone of uh, uh, abnormal plasma cells or lymphocytes and relatively small amounts of paraproteins, but they can cause some really serious clinical problems. Here's one of them. It's the POEM syndrome. POEM simply is an acronym which, which, which uh, stands for peripheral neuropathy, organomegaly, usually lymph node, liver, spleen, endocrine abnormalities, and there can be a whole host of endocrine problems, a monochromal spike, okay, and skin lesions. Okay. When patients have this, it's considered POEMs. I put asterisks against two of these because they are called the, ma the major criteria, so people have to have both of these in order for it to be called poems, but then they can have any one of the other ones uh, to, to, to be called, um, to be classified as having this, uh, this syndrome. Besides these, these conditions that are in the name, there are other things that can happen to patients with poem syndrome. They can have papilloedema, they can have edema in the periphery, including per effusions, pleural effusions, ascites, and so on. They tend to have sclerotic bony lesions. Unlike patients with myeloma who have lytic lesions, these patients have sclerotic bony lesions. Many times their platelets are up, they can have a coexistence of, a, of another condition. Again, no need to get into details. It's a lymphoproliferative disorder called Castleman disease. And interestingly enough, they have very high VEGF levels, vascular endothelial growth factor levels. Okay. A vascular endothelial growth factor is, is a factor that is involved in angiogenesis. And, and there are, in fact, there's a drug, there's a monoclonal antibody that's available that blocks VEGF, okay? And that's been tested in patients with uh, POEMS. It doesn't work, okay? So, so what, it's, what it's fe it is felt is that this is probably an epiphenomenon rather than the actual driver of this disease, okay? The treatment for this condition is some of the stuff that I showed you with myeloma. It's the same thing. You use the same agents, and, and, and uh, there's, a, there's a fairly good rate of remission, especially with some of the image, um, the, the lenalidomide and decadron combinations, almost 100% response rate in those patients with that. So some of the newer agents can induce a very high remission rate. Um, and the way you check it, besides clinical improvement, is that you see the spike going down, especially the light chains going down. Okay, and lastly, uh, this is an important uh, topic to, to, to be aware of and to keep in mind, and that is amyloidosis. What you see with, with um, paraproteinemia associated amyloidosis is what is called as AL amyloid, as against AA amyloid, which is what's seen with chronic diseases and things like that. So what happens here is that immunoglobulin light chain, and that's what it is usually in amyloidosis, it's usually light chains, 
they deposit as fibrils into, into tissues <coughs> and they, they, they result in this um, multi-tissue deposition uh, and multi-organ involvement. As I said, this usually is one of those low-grade uh, conditions where you don't necessarily see a lot of plasma cytosis. This is not going to look like myeloma at all. The UPEP, SPEP may be normal, but you will see free light chains and even they may not be terribly high. Okay, they may only be slightly elevated. The main thing to remember here is that you have to maintain a, a low index of suspicion. If you don't, you're going to miss this condition. Okay. The most common involvement in, in amyloidosis is renal. 84% patients have renal involvement. And, and the most common presentation of it is proteinuria. So anybody presenting with renal insufficiency and proteinuria, at least think of the possibility of amyloidosis in those, in those patients. Cardiac is the next one and is really the main determinant of their long-term prognosis and that involvement is about 45 percent in patients with, with amyloidosis. There can be neurological involvement and that can be both on autonomic and peripheral neuropathy. Autonomic is a lot more common. About 20 percent of patients with amyloidosis have autonomic dysfunction and it usually manifests as orthostatic hypotension. So if you see a patient that is hypotensive and you can't really figure out why, think about amyloidosis. Okay? You've ruled out you know, adrenal insufficiency and other, other explanations for it. Amyloidosis could be a possibility. It could be an autonomic dysfunction. Okay? Soft tissue abnormalities, soft tissue infiltration. You can see carpal tunnel syndrome you know, you, you, and those kind of things and you can see this, this type of phenomenon. This is macroglossia, people with really big, huge tongue. Again, in some cases, if it's very, very uh, dramatic, you might be able to tell, but in some cases, it might be subtle. And it may not be easy to detect unless you really start looking carefully for all these symptoms. This is very important in, in diagnosing amyloidosis. This is a clinical diagnosis to start with, and then it has to be confirmed with lab. So awareness of these potential presentations, somebody with proteinuria, cardiac problems, unexplained CHF, you know, getting hypotensive, has a big tongue, GI bleeding or, or, or GI malabsorption problems um, can also occur with that. And in about 5% of patients, so this is not the majority of patients, you can see uh, a bleeding diathesis. And that's, there's two things that, that do that. One is that it can, it can cause capillary fragility. It, these things can go and deposit in patients' capillaries. And so their primary response, primary hemostatic response is, is defective because of capillary involvement. And in, in, uh, in other cases, they can have a factor 10 deficiency. It's a coagulation factor in the common pathway. And so, they, so those patients can have a bleeding diathesis. And one of the, the classical signs that it presents with these raccoon eyes is this periorbital purpura. If you see somebody like this, again, amyloidosis should be, should be a very significant concern um, if somebody comes in looking like this. Okay. Once you suspect it clinically, the diagnosis of amyloidosis is a two-step process. The first thing you have to prove is whether the patient has amyloid or not. Okay? And the second thing you have to prove after you, you prove that, if you prove it's amyloid, is what type of amyloid is it. Okay? So in order to prove whether it's amyloid or not, usually you get a biopsy. Now you could, if you've got on a bone marrow biopsy, sometimes that will work, but the, the, the positivity rate on that is not as good. The, 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 the best currently recommended uh, source of looking for this is a fat pad biopsy. And you usually do it from the abdominal fat pad. It's not very invasive, it's easy, easy to do. Um, and you do a Congo red stain, and if it's positive, then the patient has amyloid. Now you still don't know what amyloid it is. And to do that, you have to then do additional workup, which all good pathology labs should be able to do that. There's specific immunohistochemical stains that have to be done to identify whether this is an AL amyloid or an AA amyloid, okay? And if you do identify AL amyloid and you know, you've identified a light chain and you confirm, yes, this is amyloidosis and it's AL amyloid, then you can treat these patients actually with, again, myeloma type therapy and in very selected cases, you can actually do autologous bone marrow transplant. Um, the main determinant, as I said earlier, of the prognosis of these patients is their cardiac status. Uh, the ones that have severe heart failure, the only way they're going to, to, to recover, they can still get treated with all this stuff, but they probably are going to end up needing a, a cardiac transplant. We don't do that 
if people have multi-organ involvement. That's only done if they have isolated heart involvement, which actually happens, interestingly, in some patients with, with amyloidosis. But if they have multi-organ involvement, they're usually treated with uh, just symptomatic uh, treatment to control the disease to, to prevent progression. Um, and then in selected cases, we can do autologous bone marrow transplants to get rid of the, the monoclonal antibody. Okay. So I think that really uh, should give you a fairly good idea of, of the, sp the clinical spectrum of what we see with patients with paraproteinemias, uh, both in terms of the asymptomatic patients that need to be followed, patients with some, some really rare but, but very, very important conditions like this uh, that, that need to be diagnosed if they present because if you diagnose them early, you can actually prevent a lot of these complications in these patients. Um, and then, of course, the, the other end of the spectrum, which is basically full-blown malignancies, such as multiple myeloma and, and Waldenstrom. So uh, I think I'll stop with that, and uh, we'll open it up to any questions if somebody has any questions. Yes? Yeah, so, so the question of, of what, why would you do an SPF? Well, people get um, SPF for a lot of different reasons. Um, you, it could be somebody that has maybe a little fatigue, somebody that is maybe a little anemic, um, somebody that has some proteinuria, neuropathy. Um, there's a whole host of conditions that, that trigger uh, a test. Sometimes people will just see an abnormal protein in the in the blood, and they will they will run a, a an SPEP. Um, so there's a whole reason, bunch of reasons why why SPEPs are run. But you have to really be able to attribute those problems to the to the, to the paraproteinemia. So if you have if you if you cannot find any other explanation for it, and if you have a, a patient uh, you know who has uh, an anemia, and maybe they've got you know, hypercalcemia or something like that, or, or they've got renal dysfunction, then yes, that patient could, in that case, have multiple myeloma. However, remember, in multiple myeloma I showed you, in that case, the bone marrow should show greater than 10% plasma cells. So if the bone marrow cells are 5, 6, 7%, then you, you really cannot label that as multiple myeloma. So what are you going to do then? Are you going to call it MGUS, or are you going to call it smoldering myeloma? Okay, again, smoldering myeloma, you still need 10% or higher plasma cell. So if you don't have that, you really are left with MGUS. And then the question is, is that, even though you're calling it MGUS, is that a condition where if you think that the monoclonal protein is causing problems like it is in amyloid, then you've got to start looking for these things. You've got to start looking very carefully, uh, if, is, could the patient have amyloidosis? Yes, they've got a small uh, monoclonal protein. They don't seem to have a lot of plasma cells. We can't call them myeloma. Or, or even smoldering myeloma. Um, but if, if you think that the symptoms that the patient is having or the lab abnormalities are from the monoclonal protein, then you start looking for some of these other conditions, such as AL amyloid. Um, if you find it, then you treat it according to that. If you don't, those patients then typically you know, are the patients that you either follow if their symptoms are mild or if they can be attributed to something else, which is what happens in many times. You know, they're, just, they're not really having any other major symptoms. They're, they've got anemia of chronic disease um, and, or they've got renal insufficiency from some other cause, diabetes, hypertension, what have you. Uh, and, and those patients can then just be followed um, and monitored. Yes, go ahead. All right. Um, going back to the example that you were talking about, say you have someone who, with a known uh, paraprotein, you know, like Wallace or whatever, and they come in with an anemia, is there any benefit to checking a serum viscosity level? Um, yes. I think, you know, if many times when, when these patients come in like that, you can get a clue just by looking at their, their, la their initial labs. Uh, one of the things you will see is that they're, if they have a very high uh, M protein, that their, their total protein in their, in their CMP is going to be very high. I mean, it's going to be like just recently we saw a patient uh, at the VA who, I mean, he had a total protein level that was beyond the machine's ability to read. You know, it was just way high. Uh, and so if you see something like that, I think you're better off checking viscosity. If you have patients that are giving you symptoms suspicious of viscosity, they're complaining of visual problems, headaches, uh, shortness of breath, uh, they've had chest pains off and on. I mean, the, 
somebody coming in like that and, and having a monoclonal protein, you, you know, you, I would be very concerned that they've got a hyperviscous situation. And, and especially, uh, you know, you could probably take your time to do that if you're not going to do anything different to the patient, if they're not terribly symptomatic. But if you're getting ready to transfuse them, it becomes even more important to check that. Because, because uh, if you don't, then, then you, know, you don't want to find out the hard way that the patient had hyperviscosity. Because then if you need to transfuse them, you need to call renal, get a, get a phoresis going so that you can get rid of some of those excess um, uh, proteins and then you can start transfusing the patient, and that's going to be a lot safer, and that's really the appropriate way to do it. Okay. Okay. I actually have one patient-related thing that actually happened yesterday. Like, oh, okay, yeah. You know, I just thought it was kind of interesting. So mm -hmm. you get a patient who came in with chronic pruritus, and I know that looking at the differential, myeloma is on there. And I'm just wondering if you had any experience with that. If that's pruritus? Pruritus, yeah, itching. Oh, itching, yeah. itching, okay, yeah. Yeah, so I, I didn't get into, uh, into a lot of those conditions, uh, but there is a host of uh, really some very rare uh, conditions that can be associated with, um, with paraproteinemias. Mm -hmm. There is one condition uh, um, which is associated with, with urticarial kind of uh, skin changes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many other skin conditions too. There's, uh, you know, that a xanthomatous uh, skin abnormality that you can see with monoclonal proteins. But there is this one very rare condition uh, which can be associated with, with itching and, uh, and urticarial uh, changes. And um, it's so rare, but uh, you know, uh, if, if, you, if you have a patient that, that looks like they might have that, I mean, it, it, you can check it, but I tip, that's not the first thing I would think of if somebody no, comes no, in with itching. It's not the first thing I thought of, but I'm just curious. Like, yeah, well, yeah, but it's, it's been described. It's been described. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great.